Ash is the executive director of Luwala Community Alliance, and many of you know Luwala Community Alliance is an organization that um, has been partnering with Healthy Villages for a number of years around uh, really uh, addressing both maternal and pediatric health issues in the community of Luwala in uh, Kenya in East Africa, and recently launched a program around nutrition um, in Luwala as well. Winnie is here from Luwala and is responsible for economic development in that community. Um, and so today they are here to share with us a little bit about, more specifically about the nutrition program that is underway in Luwala and the difference that it's making. Um, obviously, you know, ShareCare, Gabe and Tammy and Courtney and others who may be from ShareCare as well. Um, just a big shout out to you guys for jumping in as a corporate sponsor for Healthy Villages this year. And as you know, Tivity Health is uh, in that same boat as, as corporate sponsors as well. Um, so we're thrilled to have you guys here. And Ash, it's all you. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, we are so excited to be here with you all. Um, I'd like to start off and just show you a short video that gives a little bit of an overview of Luwala Community Alliance as an organization. Um, and then we're going to have Winnie come up and tell her story um, and how it's connected to the overall vision of what we're all trying to do together. And then I'm going to dig into some of the specifics of the nutrition program and open it up for questions. Luala Community Alliance is an organization that is Kenyan born and Kenyan driven, and, uh, Kenyan founded. Almost a call to honor the dream of two brothers' father, Milton and Fredo Cheng, who lost their parents while studying in the US and were called by the community members to come back and try and set up a hospital facility that could be able to offer services to this community. Uh, people just think all there is in Africa is despair and lack of hope and we felt that this is uh, our opportunity to turn a story of death into a story of life. We lost our parents to HIV and AIDS but we felt that that should not happen to other people. Our intention is to get every pregnant woman in this community to be able to deliver through the care of a skilled health professional. Where we enroll pregnant women into quality care and treatment to ensure that they are able to deliver in a more safe and dignified manner through the hospital that we have at Luala Community Hospital. We have seen the numbers of deliveries jump from just about 25% to 95% of deliveries in a healthcare facility. So we've cut infant mortality by 50% compared to our county's averages. In the last year, for example, we were able to attain 98% success rate in prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. That, for me, is the promise of a future generation that is AIDS-free. That's what I think Lawala has meant to me is they're strong on their collaboration to delivering, if you will, that opportunity to empower, empower the patients, to empower the physicians, and to empower these local healthcare workers to do what fate hasn't done for them. I was nobody. When I started working with the Luala, I was sick, nervous, strengthless, but now I'm strong, proud of Luala, and I can say thank you to the donors who decided to put Luala where it is now for people like me to be where I am today. We have an opportunity to ally with a community that's changing its own story. We want to focus our efforts in making sure that no children die of malnutrition, no children die of malaria, no children die of anemia. 
of HIV. So we, this, this is our focus to face these challenges and be able to make sure we've eliminated these conditions that cause death in this community. Every child, every child, every child, every child deserves a fifth birthday. Deserves a fifth birthday. Deserves a fifth birthday. Deserves a fifth birthday. So as you can see from that short video, Lawala was founded by a group of community members um, really at the, at the peak of a dual crisis of HIV and maternal and child mortality. A community came together, they developed plans to build a health facility that would bring health and hope to the community at large. And two brothers from that same village, Milton and Fred Ochiang, um, who through their own miraculous story had come to the US, to Dartmouth, and then Vanderbilt for medical school, they catalyzed a community of people in Nashville and elsewhere in the U.S. to build that health facility that has become a hospital and then a large community health program, um, an education program, and an economic development program. Healthy Villages has been with Lawala from very early on in that story, helping us build these different components that have led to some of the outcomes that you've seen in this video. Um, Winnie is from that same village that banded together to, to build this hospital. And so I'm really excited for you to hear her story and the story of her family um, and how her family is pushing forward our work together. Winnie. Thank you. Hi everyone. And to talk to you. Yeah, I'm Winnie, I'm from Kenya, born and bred in Lawala, the community. <laughs> My mom just talked in the video, Aww. the woman who talked about, yeah, who was in the blue t-shirt. Yeah, that was my mom. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very glad to be here and I'm very glad also to share my story and how it connects to Lawala and what we do in Lawala. Generally, Growing up, it was not so good. As you can see, the community, a small community, who didn't have hope because there were no access to hospitals. Girls were not being given chance to go to school. They, don't, they didn't have that freedom to access schools. So being a girl who has gone to school in Luala community is a very big opportunity. <coughs> So back then, my father is dead. So I must say that um, during the past, people believed in witchcraft and different things in the community. They didn't believe that there were some diseases that can make somebody die or deteriorate, but they believed that there was witchcraft. So back then, my father was really sickly. He passed on uh, in 202. He was really sickling on and off hospital. And then when he passed away, my mom also started being very sick. But we were not very sure about whether she was HIV positive or not. But we believed that she was, <laughs> maybe she was witchcraft or what, yeah. So after which she opted for visiting hospital because Lola had started then. When she visited the hospital, she turned up positive, but it was very difficult. Just as other people, it was very difficult to accept that situation. Am I HIV positive? How? Yeah. So she lived in denial for quite a number of months, <coughs> deteriorating on and off hospital. Then one day, she was very, very, ill that for us it was like she was going to die during that time i had joined my secondary education that's high school here yeah, then um, you know balancing sickness and school was very difficult 
So sometimes I had to say that her illness was the priority to my school. So most of the time you could get me at home maybe for one term. In Kenya, one term is around three months. So for three months I was out of school taking care of her. Because during that time, because living with HIV, you know, you grow thin, people fear you. So people feared the family. People moved away from us. We lived just alone. So she's in the hospital. I have been chased out of school. I need school fee. How do I get this money? The only solution is to take care of her and leave school. So it was like three months out of school, taking care of her. She's very sick. She was rushed to Luala, Luala hospital. And then she was very sick that that could not be handled in Luala. So she had to be referred to another hospital. But even if she was being referred, where were we going to get the bills for the hospital? In the hospital, <laughs> sometimes I could go there and cry and cry and cry my all. But then sometimes I was very, very happy because she could say that you have to go to school and you have to give up to this community. I was very happy during those times, even if the tears were scrolling down, but I was very happy because she had hope. But down to her, she was like, I'm dying. But how do I tell my children that I am HIV positive when the community members are not even accepting me, when my family members have not accepted me? So one day, she opened up in our hospital bed, told me that, you know, I was tested, and I turned up positive. And so it's your role, because I'm the elder in my family, it's your role to work towards getting me well, support me. For first, I felt like my mom is dying, because what I knew by then was that if you have HIV, the only solution that was there was death. So she was treated and later she came back home. Back home it was very difficult because you know she's now down. I have to continue with my education. I have to raise school fee to pay my secondary education. My younger brother and my younger sister were also to get food. How do we get going? But then one day when she got well, a bit well, she said that, oh, we you know you need to go to school. And the reason why I want you to go to school is one, to prove that a woman can take care of children <coughs> and even educate her children. Two, I want us to come back to the community and give hope to the community that it's not only through these ways that community may lose hope, but through people going through different challenges, you get to learn how to support others. And I was very happy that as she continued gaining her strength, she decided to join a program which was initiated by Loal, a CHW program, Community Health Workers Program, which works in the community. The women works in the community, mobilizes people, mobilizes the community members to go back and access health services. So she, she became one of the most important person in the community who was giving hope to different people. So later, as we continued living, happiness came into our family. <coughs> and I became so happy seeing that people would come to the family, the family that was abandoned, the family that sometimes I will come and sit around where you are, and you just walk away because you know you are really abandoned. But so people would come, get advices from her. You know I'm sick. You know I have problems with my husband. I think I'm, um, yeah. And advices were being given and people were accessing the hospital. She works in the community, <coughs> getting different people to access hospital. Identifying sick children, identifying malnourished children, and getting them to access health services. I'm proud and I'm very happy that she lives today and she was able to take me to school and I was able to prove 
<laughs> but a woman can take a girl or a children to school and can give hope to the community. And that's why I hold Loala Community Alliance very much in my heart because it has helped me give hope, be a role model to the community members. Because community members look unto me and say, oh no, you know you don't say that you can't afford school fee. When you know Winnie's mother took her to the, yeah, took her to the school, so you can. So that's the hope that is there, that always keeps Loala. Every time I wake up, every time I go to sleep, I have Luala in mind saying that this is what gave us hope. So through the support that we get from people from Donners Lake, healthy villages, we are very happy that people like my family get hope and continue living. If it was not for support of different people like you, then my mom could have been dead long ago, 15 years ago. And look at her, very healthy, walking, talking about health, yeah, encouraging different people. So I'm very happy about that. And I always encourage the donors like you to continue having the same heart that you have. So not only in my family, but you'll find that there are different challenges from nutrition, HIV, lack of access to education programs, in Lowell. How do we get to handle these situations just from the support of people like you? Many people in the past could die from malnutrition. Most of the HIV positive will be malnourished because we didn't have nutrition program, which really works to bring together different people different mothers, different children, to keep supporting each other and ensure that they access food, feeding program, they access nutrition program, nutrition education, they get support from each other. And that keeps them going, and that keeps them moving. I'm very happy about that, because many people could have died from malnourishment, they could have died from HIV. Girls get pregnant in tender age in Lowala, and that's a very big challenge that we have. And if they get early pregnancies, that means they don't have education to take care of their children. They don't have that strength to give their children the feeding that is needed to take the care of their children because they don't even know. They don't have any information about <coughs> that. So if it's not for Loala being there, then it means that they'll give birth, the children will be abandoned, they will be having nutritional problems, they will be having different kinds of problems. But for the nutrition program that we have, we get to identify different girls in the community, different people, like through the program that I handle, the education program and economic, you'll find that we identify girls who have dropped out of school, maybe because of pregnancy, maybe because of early marriages, and get them into a mentorship program, whereby we mentor them, but because most of them, you'll find that they have given birth at a tender age, we identify them with their children, and enroll them into our nutrition program, which really works to support them with their children and bringing hope to them. Our hospital works a lot on nutrition program also. The president of the hospital, you helped us in building the hospital way, which really gives hope into people accessing healthcare, different health services. Those are the hopes that we have in Luala because of you people. I appreciate Luala so much because it gives hope to people like me and it develops people. I didn't just start working in Luala Sweeney Park, <coughs> but if you look at how I have developed in Luala, I'm not the person who joined Luala five years ago 
when I was still very naive. I didn't know anything. I could stand in front of people and talk, <laughs> but currently I can stand and I can talk about what I want. I can talk about the hopes that I want to be in the community. Yeah, I started as an intern early in 2012, very young, fresh from secondary. I haven't even joined college, yeah, but through working with Luala, different mentorships that I got, I managed to currently be in my current position. I oversee different people, I oversee different programs, and I'm like home to the community because they look unto me and say, look at Winnie. If you look at Winnie, I know you can do it. And I'm so happy about that. And I'm happy about everybody who is here because of the work that we're doing together. Thank you very much. Thanks, Winnie. Um, as you can see, Winnie's a really powerful woman. She's a daughter of Luwala, um, and really the future of Luwala Community Alliance and what we're trying to build, which is um, to, to partner and ally ourselves with, um, with the people in the community and help them to drive their own change. Um, I'm going to, to dig into some specifics of the program that we, that we run together um, and give you some specifics of how this actually works um, on the ground. Uh, what that looks like, what our data looks like, and <coughs> what we're hoping that our, our outcomes and reach can be. Um, and afterwards, I'll open it up for you to ask <coughs> questions either of, of us related to the programs and the actual projects, um, but also related to, to questions that you might have for Winnie about her story or about her community. Um, so just a, an idea of where we're working. This is a, a heat map of Kenya. And the darker the orange color, the higher the, the rates of HIV. And so you'll see that in this area, this is just the, the edge of Lake Victoria here. Um, and as you get closer to Lake Victoria, that orange gets, gets darker. Um, and that's the, the region where uh, Luwala is working. You'll see this, um, if we were to do a similar heat map for um, under five deaths or for maternal mortality, it would look very similar. Um, and that's actually true around the Lake Victoria Basin. Lake Victoria Basin is one of the most biodiverse places in the world. Um, and it's also the starting point for some of the largest epidemics that we have globally. So. Um, so the Lake Victoria Basin is the epicenter of HIV, it's where we believe that the first patients of, of HIV um, uh, were. It's also the epicenter of uh, Zika and Ebola um, and Marburg, these diseases that have become not just local problems, but global <coughs> problems. So one of the things that we're trying to do at Luwala is obviously create local solutions that can have real change but that change has a ripple effect throughout the world. If we're able to find community-led solutions and find local solutions to Lake Victoria Basin, that has effects for all of us, not just because we're pushing greater equity and justice together, um, but because it's actually strategic to make the world healthier. Um, our health model has these four main pillars. Um, one is community committees. And so throughout the community, we have groups that come together that, that form to, um, to help with the identification of problems, the design of the solutions, implementation of solutions, and then, and then actually evaluating to see how, the, how successful the work has been. Um, we have lots of different community committees across our different programming, but all meant to mirror that original community that came together to build our hospital. The second pillar are community health workers. Um, they're pulled largely from traditional birth attendants, women 
in the community who um, for generations have been delivering children and providing health care to community members, but that in Kenya have been very intentionally disconnected from the health system. They've been criminalized um, and shut out from the formal health system. We recruit those community agents um, and train them as health providers and bring them intentionally into the formal health system. Um, they actively seek out children under five, pregnant women, and people living HIV positively, and enroll them on a mobile app. The devices and the technology have been supported by Healthy Villages. Um, they enroll them in that mobile app, they track them, um, and provide really precision interventions to, to help keep them healthy. Um, Winnie's mom, Leah, was one of our very first community health workers, and she's now a mentor of other community health workers and helping to push forward that work. And that peer-to-peer -peer model has so much strength in connecting individuals to a formal health system that might otherwise be really skeptical of for all sorts of, of local contextual reasons. Um, the third pillar are health centers, so actually having clinical services. Um, we run the Lawala Community Hospital, but we also support government health, uh, health facilities. So we're providing support to these government health centers, helping them improve their quality of care, and then connecting them to these community, uh, community agents. And then our fourth pillar is data. Um, we collect individualized data on every beneficiary in our program um, across a lot of different metrics. It comes in real time because of the, the mobile application that, that we use and the devices that we have, and that allows us to make decisions really quickly, um, both on an individual level, understanding if, if an HIV patient isn't virally suppressed, meaning that they're still sick despite being on care, um, then we're able to intervene really quickly. Do they need to go on another um, line of treatment? Um, do, are they having a nutrition issue that they're not able to get enough food and so they're not actually able to, to fight off a, a virus? Um, we do a similar uh, thing with, with active growth monitoring of children under five to see if they're on track um, with our growth projections and if they're not, being able to be really fast in that intervention. Um, throughout the years, Healthy Villages has made investments in Lawala um, to help push forward this work. Um, the, <laughs> we have an internet tower um, which not only allows Lawala to be connected and allow for all this real-time uh, data collection and analysis, um, but also allows greater internet access to the community at large, um, which has also helped, has ripple effects for um, the economic status and the ability for people to connect to information. Um, Healthy Villages has provided a vehicle to us that acts both as an ambulance um, and as um, a, a mobile health uh, vehicle so that we can go out into the community and provide services. Um, they've provided staff housing. We are in a really rural community and trying to um, attract top talent um, in a community that doesn't have housing outside of, of a village structure is difficult. And so having staff housing where we can uh, attract highly talented people to come work for us has allowed us to, to progress. Um, of course, our mobile devices with Skyscape, which is a platform that allows in real time our, um, our clinicians to, to look up medical questions um, and, and answer some difficult cases that they might not um, have that information um, for otherwise. The expansion of our clinical wings, actually building our hospital over time, um, and then uh, a commitment last year uh, for our Every Child program, which is really about the, how, we're, how we're supporting children in the community through our community health workers. Um, and that uh, impact that we've been able to have together has really yielded, yielded outcomes. Um, so the, a little confusing, but the top two lines, um, these, are, these are our patient numbers month by month. The top two lines are, are the last two years um, and you can see just a really distinct increase in 
the patients that we're able to see as a result of the expansion of our hospital. Um, this is uh, uh, vaccinations, immunizations for, for children. Um, we're at 94%. This is, this is higher than, than Metro Nashville. Um, and the, the county average, the county that we exist in is 57%. So just here in, in these numbers, you can see a whole population of children that are going to avoid preventable illness that, that otherwise might not have. Um, this is the metric that was talked about in, in the video. Um, so, you know, mothers who are HIV positive, when they become pregnant, there's high risk for them passing on the HIV virus to their child. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. If we keep um, mom on, uh, on treatment and we provide prophylaxis for the child and are careful in delivering of the baby and the support of that child for the first 18 months, um, that child can be born HIV negative and can stay HIV negative for the rest of their lives. Um, so our success rate in being able to do that was 97% in 2016. It was 98% last year. Um, so those are children who are being born HIV free and really a promise of a generation that's, that's AIDS free. Probably our most, most significant impact together has been the reduction of under five mortality. And the, the blue pillar here is the number of children who die per thousand in the, the region, the larger region that we exist in. So 82 children die <coughs> per thousand children that, that are born. Um, and in Lawala, that number is 29.5. And so these are, these are hundreds of children each year that, that are avoiding preventable death. Um, this is like a real... <laughs> This is a time series wonky way of thinking about it with uh, confidence intervals, but it means the same thing on the, on the right. Um, and then this is our facility delivery numbers. So basically after implementing our community health worker program, we took all of like the potential people who could be competitors to a facility delivery, all these traditional midwives, and rather than competing with them and pushing them out, we bought them in to, to the program, paid them off. To, to come work with us and to be able to have better outcomes for mothers. Um, and after we did that from 2011 to 2012, you see this little skyrocketing in facility deliveries. And we virtually have a 100% facility delivery rate. That 3% that are not delivering <coughs> in a health facility, we find all those mothers. We have a 100% um, rate of mothers who receive care within the first 12 hours of, of birth. Um, and so those are often women who are sort of finding on the way to the hospital. Um, and, and yet with all of that progress, there's still gaps in the care that we're able to provide to our community. When we looked back at the deaths that we were seeing, the under five deaths that we were seeing in the community, we found an underlying cause, many of them was malnutrition. And so our system has been set up at Mawala that we got really good at treating acute cases of care. So um, a child comes in presenting with malaria, we treat the malaria. Um, a child comes in with diarrheal disease, we treat diarrheal disease. An HIV patient comes in and they get HIV treatment. Um, but, we're, but often an underlying cause that's helping to suppress the immune system and allow the child to get sick in the first place is malnutrition. And that's not just true in the Walla, that's true globally. Um, and uh, in our county, we have this 26% of children are stunted. That means that in those early years of life, they're not reaching the right height for their age. They'll remain stunted for the rest of their lives. Um, and that stunting has both physical effects, but also long-term developmental effects. Um, there's a, also um, a high percentage of wasting. Um, and in Lawala, a good percent of our kids are underweight for age. And globally, we see that um, <clears throat> malnutrition represents 45%, an underlying cause, 45% of all child deaths. Um, and so if we're able to do something about um, malnutrition, we're able to save more children. Um, and there's also long-term educational and economic effects for the household uh, of being able to do that. 
And so together, um, we have launched this nutrition initiative, the Healthy Villages Tremuto Foundation Nutrition Initiative, really aimed at reducing preventable mortalities through combating malnutrition. And we've done it through this multi-layered approach that's really a, a ladder to, to better nutrition security. Um, starting with prevention, so there's a lot of stuff that we can do um, during pregnancy, there's a lot of things we can do at the household um, to make sure that, that households are, are more food secure. Um, for us, this includes regular screening for, for nutrition. That's that growth monitoring that I was talking about for, for kids under five. Um, providing breastfeeding support um, to new mothers to make sure that they're initiating breastfeeding and that breastfeeding is going well. The women in the room will know that that's not an easy thing and, and being able to have a lactation consultant who's coming and visiting you and making sure that, um, that that's happening early on in the child's life can make a big difference. Um, nutrition education, um, vitamins, multivitamins for, for women in their pregnancy, um, and deworming for kids in school. Um, and then the next sort of piece of our ladder is about fighting chronic malnutrition and building greater food security. And so that is identifying vulnerable households, um, providing them training in nutrition, but also providing them training in gardening and seed inputs so that they're growing more nutritious food, more nutrient-rich food, um, to be able to support their families um, and avoid malnutrition down, down the line. Um, and then we also have a clinical malnutrition program where we're taking a clinical lens to, um, uh, uh, to treating malnutrition, providing um, food supplements, um, and then identifying our highest priority households and giving them a really high touch um, accompaniment to help get their children and their families back on track um, for, for better food security. So since we've launched, um, which was in, in May of 2017, um, we've rolled 6,000 children into this program where they're receiving regular screenings. Um, 726 households have received this gardening and nutrition training plus this seed input support. Um, nearly 3,000 children have been screened for malnutrition, um, and 38 of these kids through that screening um, have been identified at high risk and, and exhibiting acute malnutrition and have received um, clinical treatment. Um, and there's just a lot more that we want to do together. First, just enrolling more families, um, but really with the goal to further reduce under five mortality um, and to get to completely zero um, as the number of people who are dying from, from an underlying cause of malnutrition. So um, I'm gonna stop there. I have a whole bunch of other slides of in, that drill down into our specific tech capacity and how um, our mobile application works. Um, but I will not dig into that unless there's a specific question. Um, and instead, open it up to you all. Um, Winnie, if you can come join me up here so that people, so I'm not the only one on the hot seat. Um, and then we'd just love to hear your questions about Lawala Community Alliance, um, the community at large, Winnie's story, or the partnership that we have together around nutrition. I'll start. <laughs> Sorry, David. Uh, what, my question is, uh, working with Healthy Villages, I, I hear a lot and I love hearing about the healthcare side of what you do. Can you talk just for a minute about the other programs you have and how they help the community stay healthy and vibrant as a whole. I've heard a little bit about the sewing co-op and the farming and all those other wonderful things you do. It'd be great to hear just about that for a minute. Okay, so talking about Luala as a holistic organization, yeah, not only in health, we have public health program, we have education program, we have economic program, which ensures that we want to capacitate this person 
if we take a person with incapacitated in all, in all ways. So for example, in our education program, you'll find that we have different initiatives, around seven initiatives. So we have mentorship program, mainly building a girl or girls to ensure that they remain in school or they transition to secondary education. So we identify girls who have dropped off out of school, we train them, we mentor them for six months, link them to different apprenticeship programs, then if they identify to re-enroll to school, then they continue and we give, we are starting this year to work with them on a grant, so we give a kind of a grant, which their families start business with to ensure that they are retained in school. We have another initiative around IRIDA, <coughs> Access to resources such as books are very limited in Luala. So we are partnering with this organization called e-reader that provides us with the different e-reader books. Yeah, it's a platform that is uh, used in something like a tablet that uh, holds around 176 books. Wow. So that means you are sure to different reading materials. Then uh, in the same program, we have another initiative that is called Innovations. That's coming up very new, just ensuring that teachers, we work with teachers at schools, around 13 public primary schools in the area. So ensuring that the teachers identify challenges that they are facing and believing them in themselves that they can be having solution to those same program, problems. So we work with them they identify prob problems and challenges that they are facing. Then, in turn, they work on ideas that can improve the challenges or address the challenges that they have identified. In our economic program, you'll find that uh, we've partnered with this organization called uh, Village Enterprise, an organization that works to uplift communities from poverty. Yeah, so generally what we do with them is to identify different community members, enroll them into the program that they are being provided with business grants, yeah, which they start with businesses, and we follow through the business to ensure that they have increased income and sustain themselves economically. In, initially, we had a nutrition program in our economic program, but uh, we then moved it to public health. Then the public health work in the community to ensure that they children, the mothers, the different people living with HIV, access hospital. How do they feed into each other? For example, you'll find in education program, we identify a young mother. She's a teen mother, she has a child. This child should be en enrolled into a nutrition program. The mother should remain in school. As she remains in school, we need her to attend, maybe she is <coughs> HIV positive. So she should be a member of a support group. We are benefiting from our health and public health program. This mother is poor and we want to uplift her economically. So we refer her into our economic program where she'll get a grant and start a business. So that's how our program is in Tamari. Okay. Yeah. Maybe if you have some. Just to say, you know, at Lawala, we, we talk a lot about the social determinants of health and think about health not just from what clinical care are you accessing, um, but what's the source of poor health and how do, we, how do we look at people as nuanced and complex um, and partner with them to, to solve the challenges that they have personally and the challenges that exist in the community. You talked a little about um, taking folks who were perhaps operating outside of the health system or the hospital and rather than having them feel threatened by the work you were doing, engaging them into the process. Can you talk a little bit more just about how you were able to do that and, and potentially how that is a model that other regions might be able to adopt? Because it sounds like that was a pretty powerful galvanizing force around it. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that it's a proof point for the, the importance of having a community-led approach where community members are identifying 
the, their own solutions. Um, in, in 2010, Luwala opened a maternity ward and so had more room and space to be able to provide uh, deliveries. Before that, um, we would provide some prenatal care and would do some deliveries, but didn't really have the capacity to do that in a larger way. Well, the organization opened this maternity ward and the, the rates of um, facility deliveries increased significantly, but were still less than 50%. Um, so this is the difference from the, before the maternity ward, we had a rate of about 26%. After the maternity ward, that rate was 45%. So a big increase, but not everyone. And, and um, our philosophy is really about how do we get everyone? Um, and so at that time, Luala went back to the community and said, what's happening with we built this beautiful maternity wing? Why aren't people coming? What are the reasons that women are, are staying home? And of course, the community identified that, hey, like the other option is to have a skilled birth attendant. That's who we feel comfortable with. Um, this is the woman maybe who like delivered me. This is the woman that my mother has, has relied upon. And when I go to the hospital, even Luwala, that's trying to be really patient-centered, um, it's really intimidating. I'm finding a, a clinician that might be from outside of my village. Um, they're talking a, a language that I don't really understand. Um, and it's, it's less comfortable than staying at home with a woman that I know loves me at the very least and, and at least cares about me and is gonna, and is gonna make that experience as, as good as she can. And so we decided, the community decided, hey, hire our people. And so we employed um, several of these, that we call them Mama Salamas. Um, we employed these Mama Salamas at the hospital so any woman showing up would see a traditional birth attendant that she recognizes. Um, that birth attendant can, can then help to sort of ease that connection between the patient and the clinician. Um, and then started the community health worker program. Um, and what's been really interesting about that um, is that the mother can still come with her traditional birth attendant and you're able to have a really similar experience that you might have in the home, but in a clinical environment that's, that's safe. Um, and I think that you know, we're starting to get a lot of attention for that model in Kenya just because of how drastic that, that change has been. You know, behavior change takes a long time. It's usually a lot of hard work, and usually our numbers don't sort of spike from one year to the next. Um, but when that does happen, you sort of know that something's working. Um, and so we're actually working with the county government right now to help expand that program to a population of a million people, um, and working with the government to decriminalize traditional work. How many community health workers do you currently have employed with you? Yeah, we currently have 83, and this year we're expanding, we're doubling our reach, so we're going to be reaching another population of about 30,000, so we'll have a patient population of about 60,000 by the end of the year, and so we'll be phasing in more community health workers as that, as that happens. Um, an initial 25 additional community health workers this year, and likely another 20 to 30 um, in 2019. Malnutrition. So, is it probably more than education, though? It's supply and access. Yeah, I think it's really like you know that that pyramid. You sort of have to get each piece happening, um, or you don't fully solve the problem. And so, you know, while we're doing a big focus on education, both on the both on like actually what can you eat to be healthier and what are nutrient rich foods, um, but also how do you grow nutrient-rich foods and how do you get the seeds for those. Um, so that's like a huge piece for, for prevention. Um, but then the other pieces have to be there for, for it to work. You'll always find in any community families that are slipping through the cracks. And so being able to provide really proactive care, um, therapeutic food to children, while you then enroll those, those parents and then able to, to provide that education. We really think that both pieces are Um, do you 
for a living in the community. Um, I, I'm assuming most mothers are at home um, if, if, they, if they have a husband, but um, what, what, how do they make their normal income? Because you're talking about teaching them how to garden, so I'm assuming somebody's at home long enough during, during the daytime hours to garden. Yeah, mostly it's farming. <coughs> Sorry, it's farming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the things that are being done there is farming. We do maize plantation, sugarcane plantation, and then uh, we were trying to transition them from growing long term. Yeah, things that too. Then uh, bringing them to growing things like vegetables that can sustain you for a longer time, but they. Yeah, they mature very fast in a short period. It's one of the effects of, of modernization is, is the move towards these cash crops. Right. And a lot of what our, um, our, we call them dig facilitators, um, but a lot of what our dig facilitators are teaching is really to say, hey, remember all these traditional vegetables that your parents used to eat? Those are actually highly nutritious and save some space in your garden to grow those traditional ve vegetables that are less prone to disease. Um, but they're also super nutrient rich rather than waiting for your sugarcane crop to mature and then having to sell off your sugarcane and then get money and then go and buy food. That's what often leads to this nutrition insecurity. While you're sort of waiting for that process to happen, you have really inconsistent nutrition for, for yourself and your children. Are, are they able to, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Are they able to grow their own vegetables like year round? Is the environment to that or how two growing seasons mm -hmm. and so there so 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 nearly year round you can be growing something um, I just know that I want to volunteer so what does that look like here in Nashville what do we do um, to, to help improve the outcome what a fantastic <laughs> question <laughs> um, so our offices we're co-located in the Vanderbilt Institute of Global Health um, so we're just on West End, um, and we need professionals with skills. And so sort of depending upon what that skill set is, there's different ways that we can plug you in, particularly around our technology and how we're thinking about data. Um, there's a lot of work in Nashville that, that we could use for people to help build that out with us. Um, we've already received some of that support from Healthy Villages, from Dom, um, and others who have, who have helped us with technology. Um, another need that we have is just around marketing and communication. So how are we telling our story in the U.S. in a way that's compelling and resonates with people? Um, and then we have fundraisers here. So um, we do local fundraisers. We're always looking for volunteers who just want to come and help set something up. Um, or for people who are interested in hosting their own event, um, perhaps in their home, perhaps you'd like to have, we have a, a book that's been written, written about Luwala, we have a documentary, and so sometimes people are interested in hosting their own event in their home and then inviting us in to come and be able to talk to more people and tell them about what we're doing. Um, you might also be interested in coming to visit us in Kenya, in which you'd be very welcome. So if there's no other questions, I'll turn it back to, to Robert to wrap it up. I don't have anything to add, except for thank you for carving out some time. Um, Wendy, I know your time here in Nashville is short, so I appreciate you, you. joining us and sharing uh, your story. So thank you all for coming. If you are interested in volunteering or doing more and you want to know how to get in touch with Ash or Wendy, just come up and sure she'll give you her email address or phone number or, or whatever so very good thank y'all thank you, thank you.